Good morning, all. My name is Dylan Bird, leader of innovation. I'll be facilitating our session today. I'm joining you this morning from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Semiamu First Nation and the broader territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I want to extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and work here with my family on the shared territory. Thank you for joining us this morning for our 45 minute session on wearable sensors in the workplace. Before I introduce our topic and speakers, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items. Many of you are probably well versed with Zoom by now and have been attending many meetings and webinars. For those who have not, I'm going to cover some tools that we will be using today. By default, a webinar is view only. This means you don't have access to mics and cameras. If you do have a technical question you need assistance with, please use the chat function. Simply click the chat icon at the bottom of the screen and type your question into the chat panel and we will reach out to help you. We will also be using polls during our ses session and encourage everyone to participate. When a polling question is asked, it will appear on your screen along with the options. Select your option and press submit. Alongside with the chat function is the Q&A button. Please use this function if you would like to submit questions about the presentation. We will not have time during the session to answer all questions live, but all questions and answers will be shared at the end of the session on our engagement tool, Engage Technical Safety BC. Many of you have already visited the site prior to the session. We'll be using Engage to ensure updates and share poll and survey results. Make sure you vis visit this page and register for topic updates. Today's presentation will be recorded and portions of the event will be shared on our website. With that taken care of, let's start our presentation, Wearable Sensors in the Workplace. Today, we will start by sharing some of the innovative work at Technical Safety BC um, that we've recently been up to and that we have in our sites for the future. We will then have a guest presentation by Dr. Judy Illis, Dr. Aline Talhuk, and Dr. Lauren Tyndale, a UBC research team within the Faculty of Medicine exploring wearable devices and the ethics around them in the workplace. This will be followed by a Q&A period. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our first presenter, Abraham van Portvliet, Vice President of Data Analytics and Decision Science. So over to you, Ab. Thank you, Dylan. A warm welcome for me as well. Great to see that many people interested in research. Uh, you came to the right session as well. Research uh, shapes our future. My name is uh, Abraham van Portvliet. I'm the Vice President of Data Analytics and Decision Science at Technical Safety BC. I'm joining you today from a condo in the west end of Vancouver. I am very grateful to live and work on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. My team and I are working closely with other parts of the organization on incident investigations, engineering, enterprise risk management, data management, data analytics. Uh, we talked about that in the main session too. Uh, research and innovation. I have the honor to introduce our guests for this breakout session, who are uh, Dr. Judy Illes. Uh, Dr. Illes is Professor of Neurology, uh, Canada Research Chair in Neuroethics and Director of Neuroethics Canada at the University of British Columbia. Her research, teaching, and outreach initiatives are devoted to ethical, legal, social, and policy challenges at the intersection of brain sciences and biomedical ethics, with a special focus on neurotechnology. Dr. Arlene Tehuk. Um, Dr. Tehuk is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine. Her research focuses on the development of AI-based machine learning models in women's health, she has a keen interest in privacy and data sharing and the ethical issues of innovative tools in digital health and informatics, including mobile health and wearables. And Lauren Tyndale, Dr. Lauren Tyndale, I should say. Um, Dr. Lauren Tyndale is a research fellow at the University of British Columbia. She's working together with Aline. Her research focuses on risk prediction and women's health in using digital health initiatives to improve personal medicine. Welcome to the three of you, uh, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Tahouk, and Dr. Tindale. So great to have you. Uh, thank you for being with us today. And um, as Dylan indicated, I will do a very brief overview 
of um, research and innovation and technical safety we see. We know that our world is changing. We know that we need, uh, need to adapt. And in many cases, we need to co-lead that change. I think that the pandemic has made it clear to us. If we don't adapt, then the BC safety system will become less relevant. And uh, trust me, uh, we're not going to let that happen. Now, the flip side is, if we do new things, we introduce new risks. Um, an innovation may simply technically not work, or even if it technically works, it may not be socially desirable. So the question becomes, how can we get the best of both worlds? How can we get the progress without those major setbacks? It's by being thoughtful and by trying new things, small scale first. So let's look at an example. We have a thing that we call the innovation spectrum at Technical Safety BC. It's a portfolio of innovations that we work on. Some of them are relatively straightforward and others are more complex. They're more complex, they're further out in time, uh, particularly the payoff for them, and they're leading to much bigger changes. They can even transform the safety system. Now let's start on the left hand from the spectrum. Let's take robot process automation as an example. So computer systems aren't seamlessly integrated. Uh, isn't that the truth? And that holds for technical safety BC at present as well. And the result is that our employees have to pull client information from different systems and re-enter that information in yet another system. That's cumbersome. And uh, bots can do this repetitive task much quicker and with considerably less errors than human beings. This robotic process automation is still novel, uh, at least for us, and it's certainly useful. So let's call it an innovation, but it's a bit more at the continuous improvement end of the spectrum. Does it technically work? Yeah, we tested it last quarter. It's fast. The processing is of good quality and it's very cost effective. So we processed the batch of field safety representative certificate renewals in our pilot, and now we know we can substantially reduce our processing time and error rate. That's great news. So should we do it? Yeah, we think so. Uh, we're basically talking about automating copy-paste work. Our clients benefit from faster processing. I believe we have some field safety representatives here in the session with us. And um, our client experience is keen to do this as well. They're busy enough and prepared to focus on higher level work. Um, and these are simple bots, so they won't go rogue on us. They can easily be supervised. Okay, this is a relatively straightforward example. I'd be happy to talk about the other examples uh, as well, including the more complex ones, uh, but we can save that for another occasion. Or if you have a burning question, happy to answer questions, those in the Q&A as well. Wearable sensors, our topic for today, is more on the transformative side of this spectrum, and we have excellent speakers for that topic. Before I hand it over to our guest speakers, I'd like to say that the question, should we do this, has quickly increased in importance. That is because technically, well, we can do quite a lot these days. So the question, should we do it, needs to be asked, and it needs to be asked multiple times, starting at the beginning of an initiative. You can't start wondering about ethics when big investments have already been made and the genie is out of the bottle. So that's what, one of the reasons why I'm personally excited about the presentation of wearable sensors today. It's very timely for a big development that will change the work on technical equipment and the safety of that work. This is also the reason why Technical Safety BC supports this independent research. With that, I'd like to hand it over to our guest, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Tahouk, and Dr. Tindell. The floor is yours. Please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for those wonderful introductions from Technical Safety BC. Thank you. Um, we have been doing research around brain and body sensors for the past year and a half. And it is um, thanks to the tremendous generosity and foresight of Technical Safety BC, as well as for, uh, WorkSafe BC, that has enabled us to do this. And as the introduction to this session indicated, we firmly believe that thinking about the ethical considerations of technologies, whether they're for the brain or for the body 
in the workplace and in our daily lives is absolutely essential to the efficient and uh, moral dissemination of technology as it comes to affect each of our individual lives and the lives of all of us as we function and operate and contribute to society. I just wanna begin by um, acknowledging deeply the support that we've had from our provincial collaborators, Technical Safety BC and WorkSafe BC, our team at the Faculty of Medicine and especially uh, Dr. Lauren Tyndale, who's with us today. And it's been my pleasure for Dr. Haluk Talhuk and I to collaborate on this project. None of us have any financial disclosures uh, to bring forward to you today. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we too in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC are privileged to do our work and share our work with you from the beautiful lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations people. Wearable sensors, think about the logo to this morning's conference, to today's conference, Core Connections. The logos show transportation, a bus, a chairlift, an airplane, an escalator. Imagine yourselves discoverers, developers of this kind of technology, construction workers putting it in place, people putting uh, posts in for chairlifts up in our mountains, our beautiful mountains, um, uh, and even our, our pilots. Imagine yourselves, each of you, wearing a sensor around your wrist, maybe a chest monitor around your chest for heart rate, something on your finger for skin temperature, or even something on your head to measure the signals from your brain as to how you're feeling at any moment. And today we know that wearables of all these types are a $34 billion business and industry today and booming as we speak. It is extraordinarily that no research prior to ours has actually interacted with people in the workplace to understand their views about how these sensors are motivated, implemented, how they evolve and change in the workplace on a daily basis. Um, and including questions about how people feel about their safety, their well being, and even cultural implications as these biosensors become more and more introduced in the workplace. And this is precisely what our work has been dedicated to and that we'd like to share with you this morning. And with that introduction, I'd like to invite Dr. Talhuk to tell you about our research specifically. And as we talk about our research, we'd like to engage with you for your own views and responses to some of the questions that we asked survey respondents and that we're gonna ask you this morning. Dr. Talhuk, over to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Ellis. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me uh, to, to share with you some of the, st the, the study that we've done and some of the findings of it, and as well as engage you in some of the questions that we uh, have asked our respondents. So in order to answer the questions that uh, Dr. Ellis mentioned previously, we wanted to ask British Columbians about how they feel about wearables, wearables and biosensors in the workplace. Uh, so we asked British Columbians ages 18 and over, uh, and we uh, wanted to make sure that all the responses were anonymous. Uh, so the data that our respondents shared with us are all presented in aggregate, and we're not able to go back, or, you know, reverse engineer and find out who the identity of these patients are, or these participants are. Uh, we recruited uh, participants uh, mainly through social media and Facebook ads, but also we've reached out to Technical Safety BC's association members and WorkSafe BC's association members and, and, and union groups. We had 344 individuals that have completed at least 20% of the survey, 296 completed fully. And these were uh, by design uh, 18 and over participants. We had a, a good split between males and females, and we had a, a representation from uh, diverse um, workplace sizes, small, medium, and large enterprises, uh, as well as different industry. Um, construction being uh, represented at 34%, followed by healthcare, education, government, utilities, and other smaller industries. So here's the opportunity for you to share some of our, your thoughts with us before we present you some of those results. Uh, the first question uh, that you can respond to using the chat function is, what do you think are the main benefits for workplaces to implement wearable biosensors? So please do type your answers in the, uh, in the chat function, using the chat function. 
I'll give you a few minutes here. Oh, we'll give you a few seconds. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you for those who have already responded. Very nice. Okay. Thank you. Any more? All right, we'll do a five second countdown. Five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you. <laughs> so we see a, a, um, some convergence around um, monitoring safety and biofeedback, a lot around health. And that's an interesting issue that we'll, just, we'll speak about as this presentation goes on. And then um, saving lives, uh, very interesting answer. Thank you very much. And uh, lots of data immediately. And I think that goes along with learning. Thank you very much for those responses. We are going to record those. And I'm going to let uh, Dr. Talouk show you what our 344 respondents to the survey answered to this question. We did a word cloud of the responses that we've received. And, and as, as you could see, mirroring what, what you guys think uh, or what you guys gave us this morning in terms of answers, that's exactly what the population of British Columbia feels like and the population that we surveyed at least. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, benefits around safety, monitoring health, monitoring, monitoring stress and productivity. Uh, and, and we had asked these questions both to uh, participants about body sensors and, and wearable like, um, uh, you know, uh, hand monitor, or like wrist monitors and brain sensors as well. Uh, and so we're presenting those and the results are very similar. Uh, we asked, we also like one thing that I wanted to mention is when we asked uh, the survey, we asked both individuals that would be potential users of this technology as well as companies that would be implementing this technology. And these results represent the overall combining both the users and the companies together. So here's another next opportunity. We've talked about the benefits. What do you think are the main concerns that workers have around wearable biosensors in the workplace? So please respond again using the chat function. Excellent. Okay, we'll do a five second countdown. So type quickly. Five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Privacy, data sharing, data use. You can keep typing even though the countdown is over. Uh, data protection from misuses. Yes, absolutely. We absolutely agree that those are major concerns. Thank you for contributing those answers at top speed. Dr. Talhook, over to you to show us the results from the survey. And yes, it's a resounding, <laughs> resounding echo of privacy and how information is collected and shared uh, are one of the key concerns here uh, from our respondents as well. Uh, so that is definitely something that, that you know, we should keep definitely front of mind as we move forward with this technology. All right, so another opportunity for you to share your thoughts. So, who should own the information produced by sensors used in the workplace? Do you think it should be employers, employee, uh, regulatory or safety organizations? And here uh, we're gonna uh, share, we're gonna provide you with a poll, I think, and you'd be able to share your responses in the poll. So please reply now using the poll. We are also continuing to monitor the chat and I'm seeing some very interesting comments uh, from you, which we will we hopefully will be able to address in this session um, and certainly are happy to discuss with you uh, afterwards after the session is over both um, through a post response survey and uh, even privately if you wish to continue the conversation with us. Uh, okay, um, can, well, let's close the poll now, please. Can we see the results, please. Very interesting employee gets the overwhelming thumbs up for owning the data and then a little a even split between ownership uh, accruing to the employer and to the regulatory or safety organization. Dr. Talouk. So from our survey, uh, so here again, overwhelmingly similar to your responses, we see that employees, uh, uh, according to our respondents should own their data. Uh, however, we did see, uh, unlike your responses, we did see some individuals, particularly among 
um, uh, implementers, and, well, among both implementers and users that have thought that employers should as well own that data. And here we've allowed for people to have multiple responses. So someone could have answered employee and employer. Uh, but yes, overwhelmingly, uh, they, it, both users and implementers thought that employees should own the data, uh, but as well, perhaps some, some individuals thought that employers uh, should, should own that data as well. All right, here's another opportunity to, for you to share your thoughts. Uh, if an employee moves to a new workplace, do you think that their sensor information should be transferred to the new employer? And here, um, yes or no. I, I can't remember if we have a poll. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay, please complete the poll. We'll give you a few seconds. We have some very interesting questions coming in the chat that I'm just dying to address as they come in, but. We'll get, we'll get through the presentation first. All right, we'll do a quick countdown, maybe five seconds to finish the poll. Three, two, one, let's see the results. <laughs> if an employee moves to a new workplace, should the data go with to the new workplace? And a resounding no, let's see if this audience agrees with our more than 300 survey participants. Yes, they do agree. <laughs> Quite <laughs> so, certainly. Yeah, and so again, overwhelmingly, uh, the respondents to our survey said that the data should not move from workplace to workplace. Uh, and again, and I think here we could have uh, perhaps a debate uh, later about whether or not the employee should have the opportunity opportunity to move their data if they so wish uh, as something that they bring with them if they want to show hey look I have a good safety record from my previous work and so uh, I, I am a trustworthy employee but maybe that should be left at the discretion of the employee perhaps and not have that be regulated so if the sensor used in the workplace detect a possible medical condition do you think the workplace should tell the worker and here please share your responses in the poll that will come is coming up Okay. And I'm just going to add a caveat here that these devices are currently, to my knowledge, classified as wellness products. They are not regulated health products in the Health Canada definition. So I'm just going to make that clarification as you think about your answer to this question. And we'll do a quick countdown. Three, two, and one, let's see the answers to the poll. And indeed, there's very strong agreement, although not as strong as I would have predicted, I have to say, um, about um, uh, disclosure of a possible medical condition to, uh, to the employee. And maybe we can have a little discussion about what that means uh, in our discussion period. Dr. Tahuk, what did our survey respondents tell us? Yeah, so very similar to your responses, our responders uh, agreed that they should either definitely or probably uh, let uh, the employee know of a possible health condition should this be detected. Um, yeah, I think that's, um, that was definitely the, the trend that we saw in our data set, at, at, the, at least. And I think it's back to you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tahuk. So on the topic of incidental findings, which is a space in which I've actually done a lot of work, um, you know, we, we see an envelope of yeses. Yes, uh, information should be disclosed, but recall that these are not necessarily health devices or in, or, uh, nor intended to be health devices. And if we were to think, and as we clearly have to do proactively about the ethics of uh, disclosing health information, we have to think about how and to whom and the possibility of false positives as somebody noted in the chat. Um, and a really a large number of ethical variables that unless we think about them proactively as we've been, as we whole set the state for this presentation, uh, we'll be in a, a lot of trouble. So that's really um, provides such a good example of why we need to be thinking about these issues uh, today and not tomorrow. And so here we come to thinking about those issues. And from our point of view, and we welcome your, your input and your thoughts, there are three categories of responsibilities 
employer and employee responsibilities that really emerge directly from the data set and those that we extrapolate for regulators and policymakers, because in fact, we didn't uh, survey regulators and policymakers per se uh, for their roles. But in terms of employer responsibilities, the list seems to be the longest and it talks, um, and we think about really both communicating transparently the motivation for implementing or requiring potentially sensors in the workplace, the type of sensors they are, what they do, what's expected of them, ensuring that employees uh, provide informed and uncoerced consent. Privacy, as you've all completely noted, is essential. Um, and that goes with safe storage of data and information and uh, protocols about who can access those data clear policies on possible findings and um, disclosure um, of changes as the workplace evolves. This is an incredibly fast moving world of technology and um, disclosure of changes needs to keep a pace with those changes. Employees also bear responsibilities. It's not at all all on the employer. Um, we as employees need to understand company policies. We need to listen and and be thoughtful about the consent that we provide about our physiologic signals, whether they're from the body or from the brain. Um, and, and we have to be prepared to come forward um, with um, uh, reports of what we might feel are uses that um, were not intended or properly communicated. And finally, on the regulator side, um, we really feel that regulators need to step up their game they need to really be um, tracking the evidence that's available from research such as ours, helping companies implement good policies by providing interpretations of the data that we like others uh, offer, providing up-to-date guidance, and also as a very important pitch from our group that's so deeply embedded in the ethics of technologies, in health and wellness, in the workplace and in society, um, really calling upon regulators, including Health Canada, to create much better distinctions between wellness products and health products, especially as, as we've shown sensors from the body and the brain really cross the line between wellness and health and can provide health information potentially uh, and are currently uh, residing in an unregulated wellness environment. So the responsibilities fall on all of us. And um, again, we would like to open the conversation up now to all of you, address some of your questions, address some of your really interesting comments and um, continue to enrich the data that we've presented to you through a conversation with all of you. And again, our deepest thanks to Technical Safety BC for supporting this work, for having the vision to see the importance of thinking ethically upfront and to the really great UBC team that I've had a privilege of leading and working with over the past past year or two. I'd also like to add to Dr. Ellis's uh, comments is that I, as as uh, this um, uh, session ends, you will be given an opportunity to uh, rank the top priorities from each of these um, uh, suggestions or these recommendations that we've made in order for us to start thinking about action, uh, like actionable items uh, to moving forward. So definitely, uh, please make sure that you answer that uh, exit survey uh, as we leave, maybe after we've just had the chance to have some discussions here, but you could answer the exit survey and give us uh, a bit of insight on what you think are the top priorities from those recommendations that we've provided. Thank you for sharing your study. Um, so now in the um, agenda, you can say we're going to answer some of your questions. And it looks like we have had some already come in. Just want to remind you, if you have any questions, just add it to the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I can get started in directing some of these to our panelists here. I think, Ab, the first one will be for you. Um, so what is the question is, what is the risk of some of your innovation projects being too far out in terms of timeline? Is it risky that technical safety BC or other stakeholders may lose faith if it's too long and can and can cancel before it bears fruit? That is a great question. Um, and yes, there are risks and, and we manage those. And uh, I think if 
uh, a key aspect of working with innovation is to start getting uh, returns on, on your efforts and, and learnings and uh, small scale applications early on. So, so um, we are really trying to avoid a, uh, a big rollout at the end, uh, which may never happen. Um, so, so instead, uh, try it early on. Um, other way to manage the risk is to have a portfolio of, um, of innovations. We, we briefly spoke about that. And then a third element that I'd like to add is that we, um, for the innovations that uh, uh, do have that, that longer term premise in it, um, we prefer to work together with partners um, to really set up a, a, a good way of working, for example, with the University of British Columbia. So we work with other research groups as well um, and, and other partners for that matter to, um, to shape things together. Um, that helps with, of course, uh, cost and resource sharing, but it also makes sure that the right inputs are provided at the right time. So these are some elements that we use and I would say so far so good. Um, Thanks, um, can I jump in? Yes, definitely. And so, you know, I, I sense in the question, um, something that I, I, I have heard, or I heard early on when I was one of the first to bring this field of neuroethics forward um, and really um, uh, beat the drum of needing to think, to bring critical ethical inquiry to the table early, um, like at, at, to align it with the, with the concepts around innovation, even before the innovation starts to, to, to take hold. And uh, there were some accusations about fear mongering that we were, the ethics people were trying to invoke a lot of fear around neurotechnologies. But in fact, I think we've demonstrated scientifically over and over again, that bringing critical ethical thinking and aligning ethics principles about the kind of ethics that we're pursuing questions about safety and questions about privacy, make the innovation actually move ahead far more efficiently, far more cost-effectively, and are introduced and accepted in society far more than if those parameters aren't in place well ahead of the game. And I, and I think um, maybe it was Mr. Bird who said, um, you know, but before the, get there before the horse has left the barn, because indeed putting the horse back into the barn is very, very challenging. And um, so it's now been 20 years that we've been doing uh, this kind of work and it has proven over and over again to bring tremendous benefit to our innovation sector, whether it's for the brain or for the body um, or for the whole sort of envelope of industries that technical safety serves to British, for British Columbia. Thank you, Av and Judy. So I think the second question here is uh, directed towards the, the UBC team. So it is, how do you ensure worker privacy when it comes to interpreting and using this data to create safety policy? Dr. Tahuk, you're our, our data expert. So are we talking about the data from our survey or the data from the wearables? From the wearables, I believe. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the data from the wearable, I guess, now that's, again, I, I think it, this is a very good question because I think right now the way uh, perhaps it depends on how employers are viewing this, um, this program in their, in, in their workplace. So if someone, let's say, is collecting data from wearables so that they're monitoring their em employees' stress levels or their employees' burnout rate so that they could provide them timely vacation or timely time off, uh, then they, yes, they would have to, that, that data would, there would be some sort of a privacy agreement where they are able to recognize that Jane is tired and needs a, a, a break, right? So that, there's not gonna be privacy there. But I think the idea is, you know, that worker and employee, that interaction of, oh, Jane needs a holiday, does not, that needs to be maintained between the employer and the, it's a confidential information, right? It cannot be, shared broadly. It cannot be advertised uh, uh, among other employees. So that needs to be treated as confidential information acted upon. And again, it depends on how the program is set up. And I, I think, you know, we haven't really you know, thought a lot about 
how this program, how these programs are being rolled out. But again, that's where communication is so important. Uh, understanding what are the expectations, as as Dr. Illis mentioned previously, like all the employees need to understand like what is being collected, how is that being used, what are the expectations, are they okay with it? Is this something that they need to consent for? Uh, and if they don't consent, what happens, right? And, and, and all of these scenarios, we need to think about them uh, before we launch into these programs. I think something like, yes, if I, if I recognize that one of my employees is having a hard time or they're stressed out or they're needing a break or they are needing uh, wellness um, uh, you know, to be triaged to a wellness program or something so that they could feel better, that's great. But it, as long as we keep that confidential uh, and, it, and it maintains the privacy and it's not something that becomes a part of their record or something that's shared broadly. I hope that answers the question. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Telhu. Um, I have another question for the UBC team. So it is, have you come across any companies in your research that have implemented really good wearable practices? Um, so I'm, I'm happy to take that question. Um, and um, the answer is yes. And we, um, we've written an, uh, a number of papers now, uh, which I can provide the references to Technical Safety BC for distribution after the session, if you wish. Um, a number of Canadian companies, uh, one in particular in Toronto that does newer wearables, um, actually has um, uh, laid out seven ethics principles by which they, uh, to, according to which they follow all their development processes. Um, and, um, and one of them is it ensures safety and privacy as um, really its two top um, uh, ethics principles. Uh, it also is uh, targeting the least invasive and most beneficial uses uh, and least possible harm causing uses of its brain technologies. And this is actually, I can, I'm happy to share it with you. It's Interaxon in uh, out of Toronto that does a uh, neuro wearables. Um, there's also a company in the United States that's developing technology for epilepsy, uh, monitoring of epilepsy and modulating brain signals uh, using a non-invasive technology uh, out of Boston. And they too have put forward as sort of its companies, karma and operating principles, uh, ethics at the foreground of what they're doing. So there are definitely companies out there leading. Uh, in the case of incidental findings, we did a study of incidental findings across wearable companies and uh, nobody had one, I have to tell you, nobody had a policy, but we were happy to discover that there was a great interest in the topic. And a number of the companies actually reached out to us afterwards to help them develop some policies that would uh, ensure good or better practices for their, for their operations. Thank you. And just a reminder to everybody, we have a lot of questions flowing in. We will answer them all on our webpage after. I don't think we'll get to all of them. But again, this one is directed to the UBC team. How can regulators best connect with major biometric sensor companies, such as Apple for their Apple Watch or Google for Fitbit, who work on a global level and may not recognize the value of regulation or local regulators? Is, is it all right if I take that one too, Dr. Tahuk? Um, so I'm going to couple that question, if I may, with one that comes a little bit later that says, who do I think is, who do we think is in the best position to regulate the use of wearables? I, I think those two questions go together. Um, so I'm going to boldly say for Canada, Health Canada needs to step up into this space and has already demonstrated interest. Um, and I think we've proven in an evidence-based way that Health Canada needs to be paying attention to this sector uh, in, in a way that it hasn't had the opportunity to do so before. But I also wanna say that there's a global effort uh, led by among others, the Office of Economic Development uh, that is um, seeking to, has already published um, guidelines for responsible innovation in neurotechnology research uh, and translation and commercialization. You can find the OECD guidelines. I think it's OECD guidelines on neurotechnology if you do a quick Google search, I think it came out in 2019 or 2020. And one of the calls in those global guidelines is actually to seek a way to um, harmonize guidance and regulations around the world so that we don't really have sort of like 
I'm going to, my metaphor is popcorn, where Canada is doing one thing, United States is doing another thing, and Europe is doing yet another thing. And so we have been coming together over a number of years to try to um, develop some uh, unified or, or harmonized guidelines that are actually meaningful to all of our countries uh, driving the neurotechnology and the technology sectors. And Apple and Google would be among them. And um, uh, we have had them actually at the table discussing with us uh, how best they can implement, again, good, if not better policies uh, that are based in uh, good uh, ethics inquiry and, and conduct, professional conduct for the benefit of society. Thank you, Dr. Ellis, for that answer. Dr. And Tahuk, did you want to jump in? No, okay. Our, our last question, this one's for you, Ab. So uh, I'll wrap up after this one, but what is Technical Safety BC doing to ensure its innovation efforts are matching the speed of innovation in BC and the world? Can you talk more about your innovation program? Absolutely. Oh, it's difficult to keep it, uh, to keep it concise. So we, we innovate as a company. Uh, let me start with that, and we want to do that, and we are doing that together with, with our clients, our, our stakeholders, uh, our partner institutions. Um, so, so we are setting up uh, in areas that um, we know will be crucial in the future, like the use of um, uh, sensors, uh, sensors on equipment in, in, in this case. Um, the, for monitoring and controlling equipment. We know that that's a strategic area. So we, we partner up with the uh, University of British Columbia in this case as well, a different group to uh, make sure we have a research program in that area. We work with our employees uh, who are actually uh, key innovators in this as well. Dylan, uh, uh, our host, um, uh, led a uh, a week where employees could uh, contribute ideas on uh, solving the issues, uh, so solving the problems that they see in the organization and having ideas on how that could better look like. So really sourcing that, um, working with our clients. Yes, there is a lot to, to innovate and uh, we set priorities. We, we focus on those ideas that we know are most promising. So I hope that provides the first answer to this question. Um, happy to talk more offline on this as well. Thank you, Ab. And I think that brings an end to our session today. So any questions that we did not get to will be answered and shared on our Engage site. Um, thank you everybody for attending and for sharing your insights on wearable sensors in the workplace. A big thank you to our guest presenters for taking the time to join us today. I would like to remind everyone that a recording of this session will be available in the coming week on our website, which you can share with your colleagues and networks. I'd also like to remind you to visit us at engage.technicalsafetybc.ca. Once you leave this session, a short survey about wearable sensors in the workplace will pop up on your screen. We would appreciate it if you took two minutes to fill out the survey. Thank you again and have a great day.